A quick note up front, this episode didn't go to plan. Whilst most of my videos don't usually go to plan, the last bits of footage for this one was lost in hard drive troubles. After debating and asking around for advice, I decided to finish up the episode with what I had. But as I no longer have the unit, I will have to say what I did rather than show you at the end. With the laser active on bare metal, it's about time that we sort the framework out. Hello all and welcome back to the corner. In the last part of the Laserdisc saga, I'd stripped the entire console down to its bare components. There was a few reasons for doing this, the first being that whilst I worked on the frame, I didn't want to damage any of the boards or parts whilst I was working on the metal. The second being that I had little of a choice. Based purely on the way that the machine was designed, I had to remove boards and top of boards just to dismantle it, although it would later turn out that my approach to dismantling it was wrong. And finally, because I could, I'm a curious individual with a history of taking things apart. It's only just recently that I've learned to stop putting them back together again. So, let's get the frame sorted. The first and easiest thing to sort was these loose feet. They are only held on with one screw. You can see how they stay in place with an aligning notch which matches up with the corresponding nub on the metalwork. And I realised later after recording this that one of the front feet was actually in the wrong place so I've swapped that around too. The front panel was the worst piece affected by the shipping damage. The mounting tabs are split and is cracked all along the visible side of the faceplate. Unfortunately there is nothing that can repair this without making it look worse or requiring paint to cover up, so I won't be able to fix this damage in this episode. To repair the split mounting tabs I'm going to be using some super glue, otherwise known as cyanoacrylate glue or CA glue. This stuff bonds broken plastic well when it's not stressed out, so it should be fine in this case, so long as we're not forceful come fitment time. Once I've applied the CA glue to the tab, I'm using a soft clamp to hold the two halves together whilst the glue dries. Now if you're doing plastic repair on a tight budget, you can use a rubber band like I show here, but try to avoid getting the rubber band stuck to the glue. The power switch seems to be perfectly fine when I operate it manually, so I figure it's actually fine and that instead it was the case that was causing the power button issues. When installing it I was also making sure that it was operating the pack locking mechanism too. It was about this point in the rebuild that I realised the easier way to take these units apart. The back panel is entirely removable and this actually makes working on the new unit a lot easier. I'm sure a disassembly guide would have told me this too if there was one. You might also be seeing all the original boards going back in and wondering why I removed them if I didn't recap the whole unit. Well, this is because I went in with the intention of doing a full recap, but then I changed my mind between episodes. If you watch my Sega Mega CD 2 series, which was also a repair, I only recapped half the board and ended up causing a fault which stopped the laser from reading discs even after replacing the laser. The laser active is much more complicated and there's all the more chance to cause faults in here than in the Mega CD 2, and finding it and repairing it would cause a lot of work, so as the old adage goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
It's the next day and the glue has dried on the faceplate. Removing the clamp was easy, but you can see here that the CA glue touched the rubber band and made it more tricky to remove. Another thing I fell victim here to was forgetting where all the ribbon cables go. Some of them are long enough and fit multiple sockets, so it's easy to plug them into the wrong place. However, since I documented my teardown, I was at least able to revisit my footage to see where the ones I'd forgotten had gone. So if you're repairing something that's complicated, take good notes or just pictures along the way. Time to put the LD tray mechanism back in. And then to take it back out because I've missed the ribbon cable. Then I can put the LD tray mech back in. I don't own a long enough screwdriver that will fit the hole for the LD tray mechanism. I found it easier just to remove the top bar to tighten the front two screws down. I had this ribbon cable which I thought attached to the power supply but I quickly realised it didn't. It went under the LD mechanism towards the control boards. So I have to remove the LD mech, again. Or at least loosen it to pull the ribbon cable through underneath it. To hopefully fix the stuck tray issue, I'd ordered a new belt to fit through the unit. There was no direct listing on eBay for one at the time of the repair, so I measured the old one and whilst I couldn't find an exact match, I found this one which seemed close enough. At least that's according to their measurements. You can see here that this original is a square cut belt and the new one is two, but the new one is half the width from the cross section. I had hoped it would still work, but the belt I got was just way too big and so it fit as loose as my grip on reality. So here I'm measuring the difference and with 4mm difference in the diameter there was no chance of it working. I put the old belt back on for now whilst I order a new one and wait for it to arrive. The faceplate seems to fit a lot better now, however the drive tray wiggle is completely unacceptable, something else has got to be wrong. You can see here how there is a broken section on this track on the tray. There is a peg that sits in this to control the mechanical parts of the drive whilst ejecting and to also hold the tray shut when the drive is closed. This is very thin plastic so I didn't want to do too much as I could make this damage worse or perhaps just cause the mechanism to jam or possibly break if it didn't move smoothly. Because of this I was also debating whether to just leave the tray alone and not risk the damage. So I don't know what to do about that. In the end I decided to try to repair the tray in the least offensive way I could, using epoxy to make a replacement wall for the peg to use. The epoxy set just a little soft but it was firm enough that I seems to have helped the issue. But I've also been told that the tray doesn't have great tolerances either. And unfortunately that's all I had to show. I would have absolutely loved to have gone back and re-recorded the ending, but as I said before, I no longer have access to the unit anymore so this just wasn't possible. 
However, what I can say is that the laser active did return to its owner in a much better state. The power button no longer seems to have any issues, and I was able to change the belt to one that looked practically identical, so the tray has opened reliably ever since. I had also bought a spare laser module if it was needed, but in this case the unit only needed to be cleaned. However, I gave the new laser module to its owner in case it does fail so he at least has a replacement part for it. And whilst it was far from the most ideal ending, it was at least a positive outcome in the end. So I hope you enjoyed this episode despite the sudden end, but if you like what you saw, please check out my channel for more content. 